um, I've also grown up in Australia, so I kind of can relate to you on that. Very good. And what was the catalyst that got you interested in proving that biblical events really happened in our physical world? Well, that, that story's a, a little bit longer. Um, because of my, my love of adventure, um, I was captivated by reports of um, a, a, a British uh, archaeologist uh, going into the Amazon jungle of South America and finding a, a city that was totally deserted, uninhabited, a huge blocks of stone, huge buildings right in the middle of an unexplored jungle. And uh, th that was intriguing. So he went back. His name was Percy Forsyth. He, he went back to England. He tried to interest uh, others to come with him. He said, I'm going back to examine the city and, and, and everything about it. Who would like to come with me? Well, his son went with him. But uh, the uh, Geographical Society of Great Britain uh, weren't interested. So he and his son went in, but they never came back out. Uh, they died. They just vanished and disappeared in the, in the remote jungle area. And uh, I, I read reports that it was rumoured that uh, he said that he had seen uh, natives in the jungle at one time with blowpipes and poison darts. And so they were shooting these at one another and at wild animals. And uh, it's possibly uh, what may have happened to him eventually. He never, that's why he never came out. So uh, my first expedition, you might call it, was to go into the Amazon jungle. I wanted to find out more myself. Wow. And, and in the Amazon, of course, uh, there, there were surprises awaiting me. What I did was I, I bought a bulletproof vest uh, from the Los Angeles Police Disposal Store in, in, in the United States before I went then. And then I flew down to Ecuador and uh, I then caught a bus. Uh, but before I did that, I, I went shopping and I, I got some giveaways to help pacify natives who might be wild and try to make friends with them. So I, I bought uh, lots of little uh, uh, mirrors and fish hooks and uh, brightly coloured the cloth and, uh, and, and all sorts of other things, like a few little tiny mouth organs and so on, and balloons. And then I caught a bus which took me two days to go to the last, uh, the last area of the jungle uh, that could be penetrated by bus. And there was a tiny village there called Shalmera. And uh, fortunately, I had made friends with uh, the, a, a former ambassador to Great Britain, whose name uh, I can't remember. Oh, no, General Pico was his name. And uh, he, uh, he volunteered to take me in on a three... Uh, three, uh, what is it called, uh, Air Force three type of plane. Uh, and uh, he made a space for me to sit on a seat and the rest of it was just cargo because Peru and uh, Ecuador have a border dispute that runs through the jungle, which has never been explored, that part of the jungle, yet they classify it as their own territory. And so what they had done was they had opened up little pockets of clearing in the jungle here and there, and there they had put their military outposts, uh, claiming that this is our territory, not yours, not yours, Peru. <laughs> and so they, they thought that uh, that would uh, that would smooth out the wrinkles between the relationships. So anyway, General Pico used to fly in there in his DC-3 plane and every week to give supplies to these. He'd fly to one clearing, then he'd fly to the next clearing, then the next clearing, and he would uh, drop off supplies to keep the, the, the uh, soldiers uh, okay. Well, he let me come in, and he, he flew in what would normally have taken me over jungle that would take weeks and weeks to traverse to get to where he, he was, but I could do it in just a few hours in his little plane, and that gave me a head start to go deeper into the jungle. And... Uh, 
Uh, without going into all the details of it, when I got into that area, uh, they gave me a, a military soldier to be my only weapon protection. He carries a rifle. And then they went into a nearby village and got two natives uh, from one of those uncivilised areas. And they became carriers. They carried the goods in for me, my, my load, for, for the time I was going to be on that journey. And as we got into the first the villages, they were for, sort of cool but friendly. As we got further in, uh, they, the natives hid in the trees. They were too frightened to face us. And as we got further in, they were distinctly hostile. And I discovered that in the three months before I went in, 100 natives had been killed in payback raids and village against village. But they didn't know anything about the outside world. They totally knew, were oblivious to the fact that there were more than... Uh, they thought there was only the 10 tribes that they, were, they knew. That was a personal world or universe to them. And for me to come in, and, and being a white man in particular, it looked like a ghost coming in from <laughs> some far galaxy and landing on the earth. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow, I'm really impressed with the detail you remember. That's amazing. And, uh, oh, yes, it's unforgettable. The interesting thing was this, that the evolution theory teaches that jungle natives are evolving savages who have not evolved as much as we have. That, that's the teaching of the evolution theory. That's taught in schools. Yeah, I've, well, I've looked into that evolution theory and, um, yeah, it's quite interesting when you actually go a bit deeper than what's been told. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, so, so I discovered these people had a racial memory of a past that was very, very civilised. And they, they, these were natives who didn't know about the outside world, but they said that their ancestors, they had no memory of, of coming out of savagery and, and, and out of animal, uh, you know, walking, walking around like monkeys and so on. Uh, uh, they, they had no, no recollection of that, but they did have a racial historic memory, which they passed down from father to son and mother to daughter, that their ancestors lived in great, shining cities that almost tower to the sky yeah wow no that's amazing um that i think that takes me to the next question in your book the killing of uh paradise planet so i have it here if anyone's interested and i'll put a link at the the end of this webinar you mentioned one of the greatest lessons you have learned is that it pays to take ancient biblical statements literally can you elaborate on this and can you give us a few examples yes yeah, certainly um well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give it a transition from what I was just saying about the great shining cities and, and yeah. they used to say that their, their ancestors used to fly in the sky and, and, and that they used to, uh, used to do writing that, that had, had word meanings in it and so on. Now, these natives can't read or write. They've never seen a city. They, 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 they've never seen aeroplanes except planes like a big bird way up in the sky in the distance. And yet here they were talking about a civilised society that was their ancestral home. In other words, these, these uh, natives were survivors of civilizations that had disappeared. And now they were living primitively. Now, this was very interesting because that's what the Bible says. The Bible mm -hmm. says at the very, very beginning, God created man with a feeling for handcrafts and technology. And in the first book of the Bible, it, it talks in, the, in chapter 4, it talks about a man who actually had a school, school of metallurgy, teaching uh, construction in metals to people. Yeah. So they, they had a, a, a civilized technological society in the early world, the first world of, of this whole planet. And uh, then right through history, we, we find that there's, there's evidence of a great flood mm. which enveloped the earth, and the Bible speaks of that. It talks about a, great, a big boat that was a survival vessel for a small group of people in that disaster. It talks about a great tower that was built after the flood, and uh, the remains of that tower have been found. It talks about a seven-year famine in Egypt, and... Uh, 
uh, and and the, uh, the patriarch Jacob Joseph actually became prime minister. He, he was a foreigner, yet he became prime minister in Egypt during that time. And there's evidence in the Egyptian monuments of that very very thing. And I have been down in the southwest of Cairo to a place called Saqqara, and there is the tomb of this man, and. Uh, there is the remains of the grain pits that were used for the seven years of famine. And then further north up the Nile River, there is a, a monument to the seven years of plenty that uh, enabled Egypt to prepare for the seven years of, of famine that was coming. And one story after another in the Bible is confirmed by the monuments of the Egyptians, the Babylonians and other races. And uh, they are... Uh, it doesn't matter how sceptical we might be, the mm. fact is that the Bible is well supported by archaeological evidence. Mm. And um, uh, there are more, more important discoveries than the ones I've mentioned that we, we'll get into later because I, I know you have some questions about those. But yeah. uh, there it is. Uh, I, was, I was sceptical in the beginning. But after being in the Amazon and then after going to other countries, I began to realize that this was different from what I'd been taught in school. Yes, we have to believe the Bible. It's got the true uh, angle of history. And uh, all history has to be compared to it. For uh, and, and we've got to check other people's writings now because the Bible can be the standard by which to judge all the stories of the past. Oh, wow, Jonathan, I love it. I mean, that really speaks to me. And, and I think it's so um, true in what you're saying, and especially because I've been reading your books. So it's like everything that I've been reading in your books is now really coming to life in my mind. And even I'm finding my faith is definitely increasing just because I'm a very logical thinker. So now that the fact that we can actually prove that these biblical events physically happened is just seriously blowing my mind right now. So... I'll just move on to the next question. Um, so what was the earth like before the great flood? Is it true technology was even greater than it is today and humanity was abusing the planet the same way it are today? In particular, can you talk about the canopy that covered the earth, how we had 30% more oxygen, the skies were more pink at night and it wasn't completely dark at night and the stars were much brighter? So can you share the evidence on how you proved this? And I imagine it would be like that the Daintree Rainforest in Queensland. Um, I've been there. It's beautiful. Yes. Oh, I'll be pleased to do this one. I've got so much evidence of this, and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to share some of it. Uh, now, just visualise this. Uh, a, a canopy over the earth, like, like a big dome all over the earth, and this was uh, made up of compressed, energised hydrogen, which took on a near metallic characteristic. In fact, it would be in the middle, we'd be in the middle on this planet of a solid water formation suspended about 11 miles above the Earth. Now, according to the laws of physics, this canopy, to avoid being absorbed into the atmosphere, would have needed to be a solid canopy. Now, a canopy like this being crystalline, ferromagnetic, would transfer energy from outside. And the energy of the sun upon this layer of hydrogen would cause a gentle pink glow. And this is the colour that is produced by energised hydrogen. Now, during the day, the greater penetration of light would produce varying shades of pink, and the lowest pink hue would be at noon due to the angle of the light passing through the, the firmament canopy. Now, in the lesser light of night, a deeper shade of pink was seen. Uh, and uh, in addition to, uh, shall we say, uh, more, uh, more, more to see that's different, uh, such as stars and so on. I'll get on to that in a moment. But at sunrise and sunset, it was a vivid pink, and at midnight, the sky appeared magnetic pink. Wow. Now, when it was night on one side of the planet, there'd be a transfer of energy from the day side of the Earth along the curved lines of the canopy. And uh, electromagnetic energy would be carried along the lines of the hydrogen, which was fibre optic in nature. 
and the result would be a twilight glow on the night side of the earth and uh, it would not be totally dark like it is today when we when we go to bed and, and midnight comes past us and the, and the night goes over it's very dark now but scientists and researchers and even now are discovering that the most important color in the entire spectrum of a rainbow for example is pink mm. uh, and i'll tell you why energized hydrogen in the canopy giving off the pink glow helps to contribute to the enormous size of plant life and everything that was living now biologists have discovered that under pink light the greatest plant growth is encouraged mm -hmm. it's a pink light that actually specifically triggers the growth of uh, cells within plants and not only do plants grow better under pink light but people respond in mood to pink light yeah uh, under under the the right spectrum of pink the brain secretes what's called a norepinephrine and this is a natural tranquilizer and neurotransmitter so in the free flood world the various spectra of pink light dominate it and a gentle pink glow day and night and the peacefulness of man's environment contributed to a brain working at maximum efficiency and these people by the way um, their brains worked so well they could and they lived so long they actually built upon their own personal knowledge instead of having to learn from other people and and the, once you discover something you, your mind goes further and further and they live long enough to affect many things uh, which we have not even done yet as a matter of fact I've produced a book called uh, 64 secrets ahead of us and uh, from the past I found evidence of at least 64 things that the ancient world was able to do that we have not yet achieved. Wow. No, I love that. And I really um, relate to the pink light because I've always been into like nurseries and I've always wondered why there's pink light over plants. And now that that just makes so much sense. So um, that's incredible, Jonathan. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, oh, pleasure. And, and also, um, Sammy, you were asking about, you mentioned the stars. Mm, uh, yeah. the, the, the canopy would be invisible. And as it formed a huge orbital lens, it would make the stars appear larger and much more numerous than they would appear to people on Earth today with the naked eye. Yes, and I was actually reading that in your book um, the other night. So I, I love that. I think um, I often look up the stars at night and I'm like, I wish they were more brighter. And I, and I know that that was once the case, you know. Um, and my understanding is after the great flood, so the size of everything literally shrunk. I'm talking about land mass, size of, um, the size of people, animals, and plants. So is this correct? Yes. Uh, let, 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 let's start off with the, um, uh, with the size of, of mankind and, yeah. and plants. Okay. Uh, now, in the original world, Uh, everything was enhanced by the environment. Now, it's, let, let, let's, let's talk about the, the length of life. Uh, or no, perhaps we'll do that later. Okay. Um, but, but for size, now, uh, in the Great Flood, all the forests, among other things, forests and cities and towns and so on were all destroyed. The whole world was, was reshaped. Uh, but in the uh, uh, in the size, uh, if you go to coal mines today, the coal mines are generally the uh, fossilized remains of the pre-flood world's forests, and what was wood is now coal. And uh, it's interesting that. Uh, the remains of trees have been found turned to coal away below the ground and they are up to 1,000 feet tall, up to 300 meters tall. Mm -hmm. Now the tallest trees today are only about one third that height. And because of the environment, everything, growth was encouraged. 
and and the and the atmosphere was uh, there were no harsh uh, seasons of winter and versus summer. Everything was beautiful and spring-like, mm-hmm. lovely from pole to pole, and uh, and there was no storms, no no uh, rain, uh, no ice. All of that could not exist under a protected canopy, which. Uh, produce such a beautiful atmosphere and uh, so larger size was encouraged and it has been found uh, uh, kangaroos have been found about the size of elephants buried (laughs) in the free flood world Uh, and sheep the size of today's horses yeah incredible and uh, and dragonflies with with a, a two meter Wingspan, yeah, uh, incredible, and the remains of humans. Yes, remains of humans up to ten meters tall. Unbelievable! That's incredible. Yes, but the, but the normal size would would be somewhere between uh, uh, six and uh, between twelve, twelve and fifteen feet. Between say four and five meters tall. And I have seen the remains uh, over in Turkey. I saw the remains of a woman, a pre-flood woman who was on the ark. And we know who she was because the tombstone revealed who she was. And uh, that's another story, but very fascinating story. And uh, we believe that she was the wife of Noah who built the ark and with his craftsmen. Wow. So we have a question from John. Can I just interrupt you there? Go ahead. We've got a question. So, um, so humans were more than ten meters tall. Is was this related to the Nephilim giants? Uh, say that once again. So, humans were more than ten meters tall. Is what you're saying? So, was this related yeah. to the Nephilim? Okay. Yeah, we'll get oh, to actually, that as the, well in a second. But keep going. Oh yes, the, the, the Nephilim were not a, a race at all of people. Yeah. Nephilim is a word, a, a Hebrew word, which has not been translated in the in the English Bible. Right. It, uh, uh, it actually has been translated, but but people who have a certain theory wanted uh, a man called Zechariah Sitchin wanted to create a sensation and make a lot of money out of it, and so he said that um, that uh, uh, t- extraterrestrials from another planet mm-hmm. came to Earth to mine minerals. Uh, and they ha- they mixed they mixed up with with a monkey race and uh, produced children who were nephilim, mm. and uh, these nephilim actually became a new race of giants. But that's not what the Bible says at all. Yeah. And and I got in touch with with this man, Mr. Sitchin, and uh, he he could not answer my questions. And it, it's been found that that theory was a fraud. The word nephilim simply means giant in wickedness. It means a wicked giant. Now, all the whole world was filled with giants. And, and, and as one group who were faithful to the Creator mixed with another group who were not faithful, their children became giants of wickedness. It was a, a mixture of two characters, which uh, uh, I've written a book on this subject, actually. It's called Such and Fiction. And uh, it's, it's too big to go into right here. But the Nephilim actually uh, translate the word and it means a a giant of wickedness. And uh, later on in the book of Genesis, the same word is used again referring to Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel. Uh, He was was big on, uh, he was a big time evil man. That's what it means. Uh, Big big time in in going to evil, the Nephilim. They were were human beings, however, and they were destroyed. uh, All those who were who are rebels and wicked like this were destroyed during the great flood wow incredible okay this is this is like so deep but i love it um so can you talk about the land distribution before the great flood like for example when i look at the current map i always think that south america and africa were once joined and australia i think i've read that in your book it was once joined tropical antarctica yes you heard me correct antarctica used to be a tropical climate and I used to argue this as a girl before I even knew Christ. So please explain the evidence you have of this whole land distribution and how these countries that we see today were once joined. 
Oh, yes, I'll be happy to do that. By the way, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to just give one little fact about Mrs. Noah. Oh, yes. Uh, whose grave was found. We stayed in the hotel that was owned by people in the village where her grave was found. Oh, wow. Where the... Did you... And, yes, I've seen it. I've been there. Wow. Uh, done both of them, t t two together. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, if we've got time, I, I can describe the grave because it, 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 without any doubt, in, in every language, no matter what language you speak, you can tell who's buried there. But the pictures tell the story. Yes, well, I would love for you to um, explain that because I'm so interested in Noah's Ark. And All right. We'll get into that section right now and I'll, then I'll pass over it and go on to your question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, when, when this grave was dug up, Oh, by the way, let me let me explain the gravestones. There were two graves side by side, and uh, one of them uh, showed this. It showed a rainbow with a boat underneath it. Now, in the book of Genesis, we're told that, that the, when they came out of the ark, they saw a rainbow in the sky, and uh, Noah was promised that God would never again destroy the earth with water. And the rainbow was to be a reminder of that. Now, the, on the gravestone, there's a picture of a rainbow over the, a boat on the water. Mm. And then there are six, there are eight people underneath that. There's a big man and, and a big lady. And, and the men uh, have a beard. The lady has long hair coming out down the back. Then there's three other smaller men with beards. And three, three other smaller women uh, with their hair. And that's on the gravestone, the first gravestone. But what, what changes is this. The, the, the big woman has her head bowed and her eyes shut. The big man has his head facing away from her, walking away from her. And the other six have their faces walking away from the lady that has her head bowed and eyes closed. Now, these are the eight people who came out of Noah's Ark. Wow. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their three wives, and they're all pictured on the gravestone uh, underneath the Ark, and she is buried there. Wow. And, uh, when, and then next to her is, is the uh, seven people. The, the lady, the big lady who died, her, she's not pictured on the second grave, but her husband is pictured and he has his head bowed and his eyes closed and the six are walking away from him. So we know that Mrs. Noah died first, Mr. Noah died second, and, and then the, the, the six survivors were their, their children. Wow, amazing. Now, yes, and, and when the graves were open, and I've been right there to the gravesite. Yeah. Uh, her body was found, and the young men who uh, owned the hotel uh, in, in, into the nearest town, who came from that village, her head had been cut off, and they displayed it in the foyer of the hotel we were staying at. And you could actually fit your head in, in between the jaws of the woman. <laughs> oh my That's gosh. how big. That's how big they were. She'd be, she'd be about 12 feet tall, about four meters oh. tall. Yeah, that's so, um, such a mind-boggling thing to think about, but it's incredible that that happened, so. Yeah. Wow. And you don't need a language to understand what's being portrayed there on the gravestone, just telling you yeah. exactly what happened. Yeah. No, I understand that completely. Yeah. It's identifying the people. Okay. Now, uh, So would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, go ahead. Repeat yeah, the question. so I was just my question before was can you talk about the land distribution before the Great Flood? So, for example, when I look at the map, I always think that South America and Africa were once joined because they kind of look like they would fit perfectly together. And I've read in your books that Australia was once joined to tropical Antarctica. So, um, can you just explain the evidence that you have of this? Yes. Now, the, the, uh, the story is this that Today, uh, the continents are all separated. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, it, uh, as you say, there must have been a fitting together of these. Now, you take, for example, the uh, west coast of Africa. 
yeah. and the east coast of South America. If you were to push them together and you compared the fossils and, and the land layers, the layers of, of land that are there in both areas, the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America, they fit together continuously mm -hmm. as though they've never been broken. Yeah. And, and there's been no, no erosion, virtually no erosion uh, to destroy the, the fitting together. So we know it happened in historical times only a few thousand years ago, which once again destroys the evolution theory. And there was not a, a, a slow continental drifting. There was a quick continental splitting. Mm. Now, when the Earth uh, was, was destroyed by the Great Flood, the axis of the Earth was tipped from a, from a, a north, straight north direction to a 26 and a half degrees off north. Now, over the last few thousand years, it's been wiggling back to 23 and a half degrees, which it is right now, uh, off, off uh, straightness. Now, the, the sudden disruption of the Earth's uh, axis caused a shaking of the continent. There was one major continent, according to the book of Genesis. And, and there was that one continent, actually, started splitting and in those splits there gushed out there were huge reservoirs of water and with pent-up pressure underneath the ground and the fountains of the great deep they're called in the bible and they burst out and they spewed their their a pent-up pressure of water up into the sky and broke the canopy they smashed the canopy and so rain started coming down from above as well as from below and the continents remained intact except for the cracks but after the flood the the convulsions continued and then about 200 years after the flood the the cracks actually suddenly snapped and the continents uh, churned away from each other and it's interesting to know that it, when we're giving, we've got a, a time period for it because the book of Genesis tells us it happened. It happened in the time of a man called Peleg, who lived 200 years after the flood. Uh, the pent-up pressure uh, took so, that long, and that's what caused uh, mass, masses of ice to form in extreme areas. Uh, huge, huge water and earthquakes were taking place because the earth was convulsing and trying to regain its equilibrium. And because of that, the, the continent snapped. And uh, there was another reason for that, too. There's a biblical reason, a moral reason why that happened. Uh, when Nimrod, uh, and, and this has a message for today, Nimrod actually was a, uh, was a great grandson of Noah. And uh, he hated the idea of God. He wanted to be independent. He wanted his own way, just like his ancestors that were destroyed in the flood. And so he led a group of rebels away from the area where the ark had landed, where Noah had influence. And he says, let's get away from this old man. And uh, they went westward uh, from the Araxis Valley of Eastern Turkey uh, to a, a flat plain on the south of where Turkey is today. And there they decided they would build a great tower and a city so that if the flood, another flood came, they could be away above the water. And uh, they, they then, uh, and, and Nimrod says, proclaim me as, you, as your king. The king up there is invisible. I can, you can see me. I'm real. I'll look after you. I'll do a better deal than, than God. And so he, he was a bit like Satan, a bit like Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And he gained a following. And those people built the city and the tower so they would no longer be scattered. And uh, so God scattered them. He, he suddenly changed the, the, their speech so they could not understand one another. And uh, those that could, could understand each other went off in one direction, and those that couldn't understand them went another way, and they scattered around. And the first settlements after that were what's now known as Sumeria, and then the Indus Valley civilization of India, and then Egypt, and so on, and from there, all the other nations. But um, at this time... Uh, God reinforced the scattering and the timing was perfect. 
that the, the earthquake which split the continents happened in the lifetime of the same man after the people, the rebels, had migrated to the ends of that major continent, they suddenly found themselves separated by distance now because the, the continents that they had moved to, the, the areas of the one continent they had moved to suddenly became separate from each other. And so God reinforced the separation. And that, that actually slowed down the rebellion of mankind. And uh, native tribes today remember that. There are, there are tribes in North America that I know of that remember how their continent was suddenly ripped apart from the rest and had to go e and went westward from the east. So very, very interesting in the history of the tribes that still remember it today. Wow, no, that's fascinating. Gosh, um, I'm just reveling in the detail, but I, I, I love it. So um, we have one, I'm just looking at the questions. I'm trying to keep up with everyone. So Mike asks, can we see the pictures of Noah and his wife and where's the location of it being displayed? Uh, I actually have a book uh, and uh, this is an e-book which I'm making available free of charge now. Um, uh, Sammy, yeah. Uh, the, the book is called The Ark Conspiracy. The Ark Conspiracy. Okay, awesome. Yes. Now, it, people who have a website. Yeah. People, people who have a website, I'll, I'll give you a web address where you can download free of charge that book. I, I have been selling all my books, and that's that's financed our work. But uh, now I, I'm I have decided that I'm going to give away all of these books free of charge to anyone who wants to use them. Oh, wow. We would love that. So, yeah, definitely. Um, we'd love the link if, um, yeah. All right, I'll give you the link. Okay. www. All right, I'm typing it in. W yep. Before us. That's B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S. Yep. All one word, lowercase. Before us. Mm -hmm. Dot com. Yep. Forward slash. Yep. Shop cart. S H O P for Peter. C A R T. Yeah. Underscore. Like a hyphen, put like down yep. lower. Yep. Ebooks. E B O O K S. Yeah. Dot. Yep. H T M L. H for Harry, T for Thomas, M for Mother, L for Lazarus. Okay. And is and and, and there are six, there are fifty one books there oh, that I have perfect. placed there that can be downloaded according to your choice. I give a, a, a very brief description of each book on that page and then a download link. Yeah, I'm excited because we've just ordered twelve of your books, so I'm getting very much stuck into it. Oh, good. Yeah. So we'll just um move on to the next question so you also talk about the city on the seabed that was discovered off the coast of peru um and i also have a quote from your book the killing of paradise planet how you said either the seabed dropped thousands of feet or the sea rose mightily that's from page 14. so can you tell us a bit more about this because this is something that really interests me the fact that there are cities on the bottom of the ocean right now yes uh, okay now, uh, this links up actually with the, the scattering of the continents. Yeah. I should say this, that um, the, uh, uh, when, when the, the people migrated out, uh, they went to all the, uh, they went to the extremities of the continent that was still one continent before the, uh, the splitting. And, uh, they built cities. Yeah. Now, uh, shall I say that in South America today, there is a city 12,000 feet above sea level. I'll, I'll mention this first before we go to the one on the seabed. 12,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains, the second highest mountain range in the world in South America, uh, east of Peru, there is a city known as Tiwanaku. Now, there is a huge lake, and that city actually used to be on, on the seabed. Let me tell you how I know. 
and that lake used to be on the seabed. It was part of it was an inlet of the sea. There, there are the remains in, in that lake, 12,000 feet, 4,000 meters above sea level. That's called Lake Titicaca, the largest navigable lake in the world. And uh, there, all along the seashore, there's seaweed. There's the remains of sea creatures fossilized there. Mm -hmm. And then the city itself has a huge dock for, for sea-going ships, ocean-going ships. Now, you can't use these anymore because it's way up in the mountains. But it used to be down on sea level. Mm -hmm. That was one of the cities that the scattered people built before the splitting up of the continents. And when continents split, it pushed some areas of land high into the sky and other areas down onto, onto the, onto the uh, bottom of the sea. The splitting actually was a violent splitting of the continents. And it, it drowned some cities and it, it raised others. And that's what we have evidence of today. Now, talking about the one on the seabed off the coast of Chile, off the coast of Peru, or rather, uh, the ship was named Anton uh, Bruin, and they actually were a, a survey ship. And they had uh, radar equipment going along the seabed, and the radar showed them that there was something very unusual. Instead of a muddy floor, suddenly there was shapes, looked like man-made shapes. And so they then lowered a camera down, way, way down, and eventually 6,000 feet down, and they were able to photograph pillars and walls of buildings. And uh, this is why we know that the seabed, in that case, must have been solid land and it dropped and in other cases it rose mm -hmm. and uh, so when you push something it can get buckled up or down and that's what happened to uh, uh, the uh, to the cities that were on the edges of the continents when the continents split after the flood wow that's incredible okay that makes a lot of sense that um there would be those kind of artifacts on top of mountains, but but they used to be at, I guess, sea level. So I, I totally understand that. Yes, very, very interesting. Uh, our world is much more fascinating than most of us realise. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really seeing that now. And I think, you know, it's making me question a lot of the history that I've learned and, um, yeah, really going deeper with that. So... Are there any remote islands still on the earth today that echo this remote lush earth before the great flood? If so, can you give us any examples? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say exactly the same as before the flood, but a lot of the South Pacific islands uh, have, a, have an atmosphere and, and, a, and a, uh, well, a, 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 shall I say, fertility that uh, is what you'd expect at the time of the flood and, and before, uh, but th then they wouldn't do it perfectly because it, the atmosphere is really different, uh, rainfall seasons and so on. There were no seasons before the flood, for example. Uh, it was just like a spring-like loftiness yeah. from pole to pole. And, and that's why trees before the flood would not have rings, you know, growth rings. Yes, yes. Trees have growth rings today because that comes with the seasons. Each season, the tree grows a little, a little bit more. And so as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, rings appear, which show the last year's ring, the year before's ring, and they often uh, date the age of a tree by counting the number of rings that it has. Wow. But before the flood, there was no, no rings on the trees. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've heard of those rings that you're talking about before, but um, is it like a physical, I guess, a it's pattern it's, on it's, the tree? Yeah, if you, if you cut a tree down and just look at the stump, you'll see rings inside each oh, other. Oh, the rings, yeah. No, I think which, I know what you mean. Which represent the growth for, for one year, followed by the next year and the next year. Wow, okay. So would you say um, Hawaii would be like an island that would represent the old world or would you say even there's an island off Australia the east coast of Australia called Lord Howe Island and apparently that looks a lot of people say that looks very lush and old and kind of like the whole dinosaur era so 
Is there any specific islands that you know that really, I guess, would represent this pre-flood world that are still around today? Uh, I, I, could, I could not name one that would represent it as it was perfectly known. Okay. Uh, if, if it was, people would, would be much bigger yeah. uh, and they would, they would live for hundreds of years and, and so on because they, the, the atmosphere before the flood created that environment where that was, that, and by, that was the result. Yeah, no, I understand. All right, so I'll just move on. So giants, I really wanted to talk to you about giants. This one fascinates me. I'd love to know more about how giants once roamed the earth were they like us or just the bigger version? I think we kind of touched on this before with the Nephilim. Um, but are they a completely different race? And is it true that some were like over 18 feet? I know we did mention this before. So the Greek mythology talks about Hercules, um, Gilgamesh. So was this all true? Actually, uh, everybody were giants. Mm -hmm. we, we, uh, it, it, is, it is believed that uh, Adam was anywhere between 15 and 20 feet tall. Wow. The whole world, everything was bigger. And, and that was, that was uh, inevitable. We are, we are pygmies, we're, we, we've shrunk. And, and, and that's not because we're normal, we're, we're actually, shall I say subnormal? <laughs> uh, if, you, if you don't misunderstand yeah. what I'm trying to say. No, I get it. Uh, uh, we're, everything was bigger. Men, plants, insects, everything grew, grew much bigger back there. But nothing was out of proportion because uh, if, 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 a horse, if a horse was as big as, as an elephant, no, I'm sorry, a kangaroo was as big as an elephant, uh, then everything else was big in proportion and so nothing would look overwhelming. Yeah, and I think also the fact that we had 30% more oxygen on in due to the canopy, I know that having more oxygen always makes everything grow and everything healthier. Yes, it does. Yeah, up up to thirty percent more oxygen yeah. actually, uh, and uh, uh, plus the, the fertility was perfect. Per, perfect. There, there were no life shortening cosmic rays coming through like there are now because the canopy what protected the earth from that. Yeah, and and the, the everything was bigger and better, and more nutritious. Most of the nutrition uh, that's now in our soil has has gone into the seas because the flood washed through all the soil and land areas, and sifted out uh, chemicals, and they became they they went into the sea. And today we have an impoverished, uh, uh, shall I say, impoverished soil. Yeah. compared with before the flood so everything that they had an advantage with we've lost those advantages and so we we don't live as long we we don't grow as big but it's happened to everybody in the world because that's the new world that we live in yeah no i've, I've often heard that and you often hear about farmers saying that oh the soil's depleted of this nutrient and they're often having to like supplement the soil now so that makes a lot that's of right. sense yeah um, so tell us the story of how you discovered the Pharaoh's chariot reels, the Ark of the Covenant and the ashes of the infamous Sodom and Gomorrah after it was destroyed. Was this destroyed in the meteor shower? Oh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, let, let's go into it. Now, each one of them mm. is, is a big subject, but yeah. I'm, I'm happy to tell you. In a, in a nutshell, let, yeah. So keep it like yeah. semi-brief. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Now, first of all, I should say that I was a skeptic. I heard that a man had gone out and found all yeah. these things, and I couldn't believe that an amateur, as he was, a, an, a, an amateur archaeologist from the United States, Ron Ladd, could, could have found Noah's Ark, could also have found Sodom and Gomorrah, could also have found the, the Red Sea crossing with Pharaoh's chariots, could also have found the true Mount Sinai because tourists are going to the wrong mountain in the wrong country today, and could also have found the Ark of the Covenant. I could not believe that an amateur could have found all these things under the noses of the professionals who'd been searching for ages. Yeah. And so I was sceptical. And I went, but I, I, a sceptic has two options. A sceptic can either repeat the, uh, the arguments of others that did not believe the man, yeah. and uh, in which case uh, it becomes your argument against him, 
or you can put your money where your mouth is. You can go and, and search for it. Go to the spot yourself. You go and confront the man yourself, and then you you weigh up the evidence. That's the honest thing to do. And so I, I did pray to the Lord about this matter when mm. I, was, I heard this, and I thought, well, I don't believe he's found all these things. He might have thought he's found them, but I, he's, he's either, he's either a, a, a madman or else he's magic, <laughs> a magic man. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But uh, but I contact. I decided to contact him, and I got his phone number, and I rang halfway across the world from Australia to the United States. Mm. And eventually, I made a time that I was going to go and see him. I drew out all my money out of my bank account. I got on a plane to Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I, but for two weeks before I left, I prayed to God. I said, Lord, if I am mistaken, please show me. I want to know beyond any doubt. I don't mind being mistaken because I, all I really want to know is the truth. I don't believe he's done it. I think it's too much for one man to find. But I, I'm willing to be wrong if I can find out what the truth is. Oh, wow. And, and when I got to Nashville Airport, his wife, Mary Nell, met me. She said, well, Ron's taking a, a, showing some of his evidence in a house tonight. So I've come to the airport to pick you up, Jonathan, and we've got some wonderful things to show you. I almost said, Mary Nell, you might be a nice person, but you could be mistaken. I think I've got evidence against you that's strong enough to, sh to show you. But you'll be very disappointed, but I've, I've got to show it to you. Well, I got to that house. Uh, Ron came to the door. He had a video going of, of, of his discovery in the Mount Sinai. And... Uh, he invited me in, I sat down, and within 10 minutes, it was like a voice speaking to me, Jonathan, you're mistaken. This man is showing and telling the truth. And I knew then that I would have to go through all of my objections. I would have to look very carefully at everything he'd shown me, showed me, and I would then know that he was telling the truth, and I knew that before I started my objections. But I, I knew that because God impressed me as I sat down and watched that video footage. And I knew then that my trip to overthrow Ron Wyatt was in vain, that I had to accept it because the evidence would be given to me that week. And sure enough, it was. I spent a whole week in his house. And uh, then he said to me at the end of the week, I'm going to Turkey on Monday to, go to visit Noah's Ark again. Wow. He had been there 43 times. Wow. That's incredible. Getting new evidence all the time. Now, if you, have, if you haven't got new evidence the first time, uh, after 43 visits, you'd either prove that it's wrong, it's a big mistake, or else you'd have a, a watertight case. Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, that's very interesting. Thank you, Jonathan. So I, we're going to keep it to the integrity. We, we said this webinar would go for an hour today, so it's almost 10.30, so I'm going to just put it out that if anyone has any questions, put it in the text chat and I can ask Jonathan. And then we're also going to be doing a part two of this webinar next week because we have a lot of questions for you, Jonathan. And we, we just are really amazed with your wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for coming on today and sharing it with us. It's been incredible. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Sammy and Warren. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Oh, no. Thank you for your amazing work and, um, you know, putting out to the world what you have discovered and this evidence because it really is remarkable so i'll just check anyone have any questions um otherwise yeah no we definitely have um quite a few on this powerpoint that i've created we have a few more questions but they're all very big questions so that's why i kind of knew today that we would break it up into two very good Yep, so everyone's just, so what's, okay, I'm just waiting for the questions. So, hang on. So with the, um, oh wow, there's, a, there's just a lot of questions coming in, so just bear with me. Um, sure. Okay. So, 
the current arc that's um, Noah's arc. So is that? Can you confirm that that's still in Turkey on Mount Ararat right now? It's in Turkey on the mountains, plural of Ararat, but not on Mount Ararat. Oh, so and I assume that's now a military base. Is that correct? So no one can get to it. It's a difficult place to get to, yeah. but the, the Turkish government has now made this an historical national park. Ah, oh, for that reason or another reason? Uh, I, called, I called it the Noah's Ark Regional Park. <gasps> really? I didn't know that. That's, that's quite, you know, it's amazing how that information hasn't gone to any mainstream news, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So what are the trace um, origins of the giants? The giants were, were created uh, before the flood. Yeah. Uh, after the flood, uh, man's lifespan and size slowly decreased. So it was a gradual change. Yeah. Now, my wife comes from a Pacific island, and, uh, and on that island they call it the island of tombstones. Yeah. And there's hundreds of, of giant graves there. Wow. Graves of hundreds of giants up to 12 feet tall. Yeah. And were these giants descendants from the fallen? That's a question from Joel. That, that they, they came from Noah's Ark. Out of, like, they're descendants of Noah and his family. Right. All, all of the people who were not on the Ark died. So they had no descendants. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's interesting. Wow. All right. So any last questions? And then we'll wrap it up. Um, and Joel's asking, what about the elite? I'm not quite sure what he means, but you might know, Jonathan. Apparently, they call these giants. Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think he's referring to the fallen. We often talked about the fallen angels who came down to earth. Um, do you know much yeah, about that, Jonathan? Yes. The, for, the fallen angels have not amalgamated with mankind that's that's a fallacy yeah if someone would, would like to download my ebook which I, I think i've got there on that list uh it's called sitch and fiction okay s-i-t-c-h-i-n fiction sitch and fiction that that's where the theory came from right. that, out of that man's head a lot of people have followed him thinking that he was telling the truth but he he made claims which can easily be disproved and it took me a book to do it, but that book is worth reading if you have any questions on that subject. Okay, great. So um, that should no answer... No charge. No, no charge. No charge. Okay, that should answer your question, Joel. There's a free book available on that subject. Okay. Um, Christine. Christine has a question. Apparently, the Smithsonian has been dumping giant skeletons in the ocean trying to cover up the evidence um, that refutes current theory. Do you know much about that, Jonathan? Oh, yes, most certainly. Oh, I've wow. dealt with people involved in it. Uh, in fact, a, 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 a ship's captain who was hired by the Smithsonian Institute to dump artifacts that, that, that destroy the evolution theory, he actually contacted me and we've been communicating. And he said that he, he was the tugboat captain that had to pull the artifacts out into the Caribbean Sea and throw them overboard. Amazing. He, I've got his details, He's, I have his name, I have his email address, and I have his position and what company he worked for. Wow. Wow, no, that's incredible. All right, um, so I think we'll leave it there for today, and we will definitely um, be in contact with you, Jonathan, about our part two um, for, I would like to say, next week, but we will um, we'll keep everyone posted of, in, on our email list. So thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you again, Jonathan, for sharing all your amazing wisdom. And we really, really look forward to when we can talk to you next. My, my pleasure, Sammy. Stay safe and enjoy lovely New Zealand. I miss that country. I love that country. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.